In this video, I want to introduce molecular orbital theory. Now, at this point, we've discussed the Lewis model, Vesper theory, and orbital hybridization. And all of these models are useful and applicable in their own ways, understanding that they do have some limitations. Molecular orbital theory actually uh, compensates for a lot of those limitations of these other theories in a very specific way. So the Lewis and the Vesper model and hybridization are all based on these one center orbitals, localized electrons, right? And, and when we looked at in the first unit with resonance, right, we saw that electrons are inherently delocalized throughout the entire molecular framework. So it's really insufficient to describe something that's inherently delocalized as something that is localized on individual atomic centers. So what molecular orbital theory does is it creates these molecular orbitals that are, you know, that are not confined to any localization. And it therefore builds a much more accurate description of these inherently delocalized electrons. Right. So it's kind of like a solution to this localization issue with all of the other models that we've looked at. Right. So to, to introduce molecular orbital theory, I want to look at a really simple example. So let's uh, let's consider the H2 molecule. Right. So H2 involves one bond between two hydrogens. Simplest molecule you can think of. Right. Uh, for this purpose, I'm going to label each one differently. So this one I'll call hydrogen A and it will be bonded to hydrogen B, right? This is your Lewis structure for H2. You got two hydrogens, one bond, right? So you can visualize molecular orbitals as combinations of atomic orbitals, right? So the molecular orbitals, and I'll abbreviate molecular orbitals as MOs. So MOs are a combination of atomic orbitals. Right, so if we're trying to define this, the molecular orbitals that will define the bond uh, or define the molecule H2, right, um, then we're going to have interactions between the 1S on hydrogen A and the 1S on hydrogen B, right? So I'm gonna draw that out here. So we'll have this 1s orbital on hydrogen A, so I'll call that 1s A, right? Let me actually give myself a little bit more room here. So we'll have the 1s on hydrogen A, so we'll have 1s A plus the 1s orbital on hydrogen B, 1s B, right? So similar to what we saw with orbital hybridization, right? Remember, if we uh, if we had four uh, orbitals involved in the hybridization, then we ended up with four hybrid orbitals, right? Four atomic orbitals would make four hybrid orbitals, right? Five atomic orbitals would make five hybrid orbitals, two atomic orbitals, two hybrid orbitals. Same thing here with molecular orbitals. If you have two atomic orbitals, then you must have two molecular orbitals as a result. So what we're going to have here is an interaction between these two orbitals, 1s a and 1s b, right? One interaction is going to be a constructive interaction. Constructive interaction. And when I talk about constructive, I'm talking about the wave properties, the inherent wave properties of these orbitals, right? Um, we talked about this in the previous course, but, you know, electrons behave like waves. There's this duality between, you know, waves and particles and matter, right? So electrons can, when they uh, come together, these orbitals come together, they can have constructive interference or destructive interference, right? So we can have this constructive interaction between the two orbitals or we can have a destructive interaction, right? So constructive interaction versus destructive interaction. So what would both of those look like? So the constructive interaction would look like the following, right? So we have these two. So these two dots represent our atomic centers, the two hydrogens, 
right? So these molecular orbitals would just overlap and form one big orbital over the entire H2 framework, right? So this will be our first molecular orbital that for now I'll just call MO1, right? Now, if we have a destructive interaction, then what's gonna happen is that in the bonding region, there's actually won't be any electron density. There won't be any orbital density in that internuclear region. So we'll have an orbital that'll look like this. And I should draw it kind of like this, right? So, right, so in this case, we have what's known as a node in this internuclear region. Right. And a node is just a region of space where there's no orbital. Right. Um, or speaking, you know, in the language of quantum mechanics, this, there's a region where, where there's no wave function, where the wave function is zero. Right. So having this node in the bonding region is indicative of a destructive interaction between the two 1s orbitals. Right. So I'll call this guy MO2. Right. Cool. So we had two atomic orbitals and now we get two molecular orbitals. Right. These were our original atomic orbitals. Right. 1SA and 1SB. And then these are our molecular orbitals. Right. We've got MO1 and MO2. OK, so um, so these two MOs are inherently different. When you have a constructive interaction between these two atomic orbitals, we call these bonding orbitals. So this is going to be a bonding orbital. And then when you have this node in the internuclear region, this is what we call an anti-bonding orbital. Right? So you have a bonding molecular orbital and an anti-bonding molecular orbital. Now, I want to get more specific with the labeling here because uh, we're not just going to label things MO1, MO2, MO3, right? We actually have a labeling scheme that we can employ here. So let me go through the rules of how we label MOs. So MO labels depend on a few factors. So the first factor is going to be the shape of the orbital, Right. So this is, is it a sigma bond or is it a pi bond? Right. And these are both going to be sigma interactions here. So these are both sigma bonds. And the second criteria is what are the parent atomic orbitals? The parent atomic orbitals. By parent atomic orbitals, I mean, what were the atomic orbitals that gave rise to these molecular orbitals? In this case, it was two 1s orbitals that gave uh, rise to these molecular orbitals. And the third criteria is whether they're bonding or antibonding. So whether you have bonding or antibonding. Right, so, so when you're trying to label a molecular orbital, you wanna ask yourself, okay, what's the shape? Is it sigma or pi? What's the parent atomic orbitals? 1s, 2s, 2p, what have you. Uh, and the third question you want to ask is, is it bonding or antibonding? So taking this criteria, we can label both of these uh, molecular orbitals, right? So this molecular orbital is a result of 1SA, a constructive interference between 1SA and 1SB, right? So this is going to give us a label of sigma 1S for this guy. So it's a sigma orbital and its parent atomic orbital is a 1s orbital, right? Uh, for MO2, we have a destructive interaction. So I'm going to do 1sA minus 1sB. And so for this one, we're going to have sigma 1s star, Right. So the star stands it, uh, denotes that it is an antibonding orbital. So if it's a bonding orbital, you don't put a star. If it's an antibonding orbital, you put the star. Right. So uh, so the shape, the parent atomic orbital and whether the orbital is bonding or antibonding will determine how you label each of these molecular orbitals. Right. OK, so this is the general idea of molecular orbitals, right? They're composed of linear combinations of atomic orbitals, right? Um, and they actually are delocalized throughout the molecular framework. And we've kind of went over how to label these here. So uh, in the next video, we're going to go into 
uh, the energies of these different molecular orbitals and how they actually relate to bond strength. 